Hello, everybody. It's a wonderful evening here in Gurgaon today, though the times uh, are not exactly wonderful. They're, they're far from wonderful. Uh, terrible things happen happening in the country and in the world around. Uh, but then, you know, in the midst of all this, one has to find some sanity and some and the resilience to go on. And uh, thanks to my author friend and a very dear friend, Koral Das Gupta, who has uh, who's always uh, kept me in mind whenever she comes up with new and interesting initiatives, which all of us know she, uh, she keeps on doing a lot of interesting things uh, every now and then. So she, uh, she, she has invited me to be in conversation with an extremely interesting, learned um, person from uh, very, very far away from India. But that's the beauty of technology that, you know, uh, I sitting in Gurgaon, I'm connected with Professor Leonard Casuto, uh, who is uh, who is a, who is probably um, spent years studying true crime and um, and the history of true crime literature in America and across the world. And uh, he teaches American literature at Fordham University, and he's a passionate researcher in crime fiction. Uh, we, uh, you know, and I'm delighted to explore the various um, aspects of the genre with him and seek his knowledge for our audience. So, uh, a Professor, welcome to this chat. Uh, and on the platform, tell me your story, which which Coral has uh, has begun uh, uh, quite some time back. And we've had very interesting uh, speakers on this platform. So, a very warm welcome from far, far away from from where you are, from India and from Gurgaon. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So, uh, Professor, the thing is, as, as I was telling you before we uh, before we started this chat, that while I have written um, while I've written one novel um, on crime, my second book, um, uh, Nobody's Child, which is which is a dark uh, crime uh, fiction, uh, though it has not been inspired by uh, by true crime. Uh, uh, however, certain characters um, certain characters are um, are inspired by true people. And I was reading a couple of your articles. You've written so many articles on true crime books, et cetera, essentially articles and papers. And I was reading, um, you know, reading some of them today to, to equip myself with, with, with pointers to talk to you. So, you know, in your, uh, in your opinion, what, do, what is it that makes people kill other people who have done nothing, nothing bad to them? Well, that, that is the big mystery, isn't it? The, uh, and I think we need to split it up into two parts. There is the real life occurrence where people kill other people who apparently have done nothing to them. And in fact, that's mm -hmm. usually the case. And there's also the, the fictional story of that happening. And they mm -hmm. are not always the same. It's true that, that writers of fiction take their inspiration from real life but it's also true that writers of fiction shape real life in ways that make it into, in, uh, well, stories that aren't always possible. For example, the archetype of the uh, killing people for, who have never, um, the, ar the archetypal character who exemplifies the idea of killing people who have done nothing to him in our time is Hannibal Lecter, who is uh, the creation of Thomas Harris, and is the star of, I think, three novels, three or four movies, a television series. In, in other words, Can Hannibal Lecter really touched a cultural nerve mm. in the United States. And um, for those who have not encountered this, the ongoing saga of Hannibal Lecter, he's a trained psychiatrist who mm. um, is also, who's, goes rogue and uh, basically makes a project of killing people of his choice, some of whom are after him, but not all of them. Um, Lecter, is, Lecter is impossible. He is impossible by the standards of any form of modern psychology or even just the expectations of real life. He's impossible because he's hyper competent and psychopaths like, uh, like Hannibal Lecter who mm -hmm. kill people for pleasure are, have been studied by psychologists for generations. And uh, Lecter lacks the, in the kind of insecurity that is common to all of them in real life. 
and arguably is common to all people in one form or another in real life. Lecter is completely self-contained and completely uh, able to meet his own needs. That's not real. It's a, so it's a case of, some, of taking real life because Hannibal Lecter was inspired by, uh, he's a pastiche of several real life cases, including for, mm. for example, the very famous case of Ed Gein in, in uh, the 1950s, who was also the inspiration for Psycho. Mm. Um, uh, Lecter, is, uh, Lecter, Lecter was in, inspired by real life, but he's not real. And so if we're going to ask what motivates him, it's a different question from what motivated Ed Gein. Hmm. So suppose if we, you know, if someone were to ask you to distinguish between <clears throat> Hannibal Lecter and um, Dennis, Ra uh, Dennis Rader, the the uh, the Kansan, um, murderer, who who is this, who is kind of um, titled as the BTK mur murders. So if you were to do a comparative or a distinguishing study between these two personalities, uh, you know, what would be your assessment? Because because they both are very competent. But uh, Lecter is, you know, is, is competent in a very different manner. Whereas, whereas Dennis, he, uh, he kind of almost um, enjoyed, enjoyed control and enjoyed meddling with others. So, you know, what would be your assessment uh, on these two? Yes, first, first of all, just a, a little background. Dennis, Dennis Rader was the, B, the BTK killer, that mm -hmm. is, as you say. But BTK stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. Yeah, and he was uh, a uh, a serial killer who was active for a period of of mm -hmm. years in the Midwest, mm -hmm. and um, was taunting the police. Mm -hmm. And then he went dormant, but he was eventually caught uh, through um, computer tracing. So he yes. he left the f files that he um, that he sent to the police had a a computer signature that could be mm -hmm. traced back to his church and he was uh, tracked down from there. Uh, and now he is so that in, is, in that prison. That is a sign of, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is a clear sign of complacency, right? He just got overconfident. He thought that, you know, there's, there's nobody, nobody would be, that, that he's uncatchable. You know, he's, he's practically invincible. Won't you say that? I think that is fair to say, yes. Uh, now, yeah. the, uh, since being imprisoned a good decade or more ago, Den, uh, Dennis Rader, it, quite properly, we have heard very little from him. Although I noticed mm. that his daughter wrote a memoir of growing up with him and finding out that her father was a notorious serial killer. But I've not read the book. So this is a long way of saying that I don't have any particular privileged insight for, through my own reading or anything else into the, uh, the inside of Dennis Rader's head. Uh, I think you're correct that he had a thing about control. When he was captured, there mm. were a lot, of, a lot of his neighbors were interviewed and they found him to be a very officious neighbor. And certainly, yes, he was very competent. That's, he, he was caught only through his own carelessness because he was, he was very careful. Mm. But he had a need. He, he had a need and that need led him to uh, taunt the police. And if he hadn't done any of that, if he hadn't sent the police that computer file, then he'd be at large today. And uh, Pop and his, uh, his existence would probably continue to be a secret from his now former wife and his children. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of uh, people having needs and seeking to fulfill those needs, that's the story of literature in general. That's the story of being human. Human, human beings are motivated by desire and Crime fiction, and, well, and crime stories, whether true or not, are mm -hmm. well, one way to look at them is that they are simply stories of one, one version of that very human tendency to want things and to mm -hmm. try to get them by whatever means makes sense. For most of us, it's not mm -hmm. sensible to transgress and uh, transgress the law, take those risks, and it's uh, and most of us object on some level to hurting other people in order mm -hmm. to satisfy our own desires. But that doesn't mean that some people don't do it, first of all, and second, that storytellers can't imagine people doing it. 
So I wanted to ask you actually two questions. First is, you know, something which has baffled me uh, and which, which, is, which has been on my mind. And it's a bit psychological and I don't think it's fair, but I just wanted to kind of put, um, put forth this question to you. In your opinion, and, you know, from the exhaustive study on the subject that you have done on various books and etc., what is your opinion? You th do you would you say evil is born or is it nurtured? Because when I, you know when you look at the uh, when you look at the history of uh, of the serial killers, almost all of them. Correct me if I'm wrong. Almost all of them have had damaged childhoods. They have had they've, they've faced severe child abuse. They've sexual, physical as children. Uh, possibly exposure to drugs, beatings, etc. So they are all product of uh, extreme violence and uh, you know, and very very sad and difficult childhood. I can't think of a single serial killer who has come out of a very happy family. I mean, correct me if I'm not wrong, Professor, uh, because you would know uh, a lot more about this. Is there a serial killer uh, that you know of who has come out of a very good uh, you know, good and happy family, and yet has gone ahead to be um, be a vicious killer. Well, first of all, there are different ways of looking at happy and unhappy families. You're you're certainly correct that in real life, people mm -hmm. who are who who commit who are who are pathological murderers are damaged, but that's also how society defines them. That you can put such a person in the military. And if you find the right situation for that person, uh, he, it's usually going to be a he, can have a, uh, a long career and maybe even win some medals. This, this question of nature versus nurture is not just a crime literature question, of course. It's a, it's a literature question. The, that's, it's a question that authors of, from all genres are contemplating. Yet it, it, is, it is true that we can look at people who are, um, who, who, are, who are psychopaths and we can usually find some kind of, of uh, cruelty in their childhoods. Mm. It's also true that uh, many people are exposed to similar cruelties and they don't turn into murderers. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is, I think one we're going, that we as human beings are going to chase for the rest of our days but I think that we can, what, what it's doing, what, what, what your question points to is the way that, that crime writers train an unusually uh, sensitive scope onto that particular question when it relates, as it relates to violence. That crime, crime literature is asking, why do people do things that are against the law? And what is against the law is often against our moral desires and preferences as well. So you say, okay, why do people transgress? The, uh, those, those are questions that some stories don't contemplate. For example, a heist, a heist a crime fiction includes heist tales. Mm -hmm. You can understand why people would want to steal a lot of money because if, once, if they get away with it, then they'll be able to live comfortably in ways that they imagine will make them happy. So does that does it make you a psychopath to want to to want to steal a lot of money? Well, you know, I, I suppose it depends on who's looking and why and how. And if you're writing fiction, how is that being how how is that scenario being created? In, um, for example, Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, the uh, his first novel, and the debut of Philip Marlowe, one of the most enduring and influential characters in crime fiction. Marlowe is, is a detective, and in The Big Sleep he encounters criminals of all different kinds of stripes. And some of them are clearly just in it for the money. At least one of them is in it because he seems to enjoy hurting people. And Marlo, the story that Chandler uh, creates in The Big Sleep is a story of trying to do, uh, trying, trying to mend a world that, is, that has been damaged by transgressions of all kinds and, and the, which have, the decline of a family. So um, I have suggested in the, um, the, the book that I wrote a while back, um, let's see, do I? It 
it's here. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I've suggested that if you that if we want to understand a lot of the crime fiction that's written in America and also elsewhere, because American crime fiction has been very influential, uh, if we want to understand the engine that makes American a lot of American crime fiction go, we need to look at the challenges that crime poses to traditional domestic setups, happy families, happy, happy societies that are composed of happy families. And if we try to, uh, to, to look at these stories, we see a series of attacks on families and the idea of happy families. And so when we see that in, in The Big Sleep, Philip Marlowe comes onto, Ch onto the stage, Ch Chandler kept him there for more than 20 years before, Ch before Chandler died. Philip Marlowe's first mission is to try to rescue a broken family. And uh, I've suggested that a lot of the American crime writers think of the way that, uh, uh, that the, the well, think of, think of their stories in terms of that. Like this, this could also be true of the, um, uh, of the um, recent best-selling um, novel called The Perfect Nanny or The Lullaby uh, by, uh, by Leela Slimani, which is, which is being talked about a lot, that it's based on, um, on a true crime story and it, and it talks a lot about, um, it talks a lot about the social uh, milieu and the social setup of our current times. Would you, would you like to say, would you like to, you know, comment on some of the uh, recent crime novels which are based on true crime, which, um, uh, which have hit the bestseller charts in the recent times? Well, I haven't read that one, but um, the, but if you, but two, two of them that, uh, well, for example, one that, had, one, one that went crazy a few years ago is Gone Girl. Jillian mm. Flynn's Gone Girl. Yes, yes. I and that, yeah. you, you can, Gone Girl certainly fits the argument that I was outlining a minute ago. The idea that, um, that the crime is proceeding from some kind of attack on the idea of a perfect family. Mm. That the, um, the, main, the main characters turn Amy. out not to be what we think they are. Yeah. Mm. And okay. the girl on the train is mm. I think uh, possibly if not if, if it wasn't inspired by Gone Girl, it certainly is a, a case of um, a, an invention of a similar sort of wheel. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, the girl the girl on the train, which was uh, another huge bestseller, this one from yeah. England, uh, and made into a film as Gone Girl was. Uh, again, it starts with the idea it starts starts with uh, a marriage that goes off the tracks. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and and when we understand this story, I'm not going to supply any spoilers, mm -hmm. but to to un to understand this story after you've finished reading it is unavoidably to contemplate what it means for people to desire a kind of domestic harmony within a social setting, a community that embraces and encourages that kind of domestic harmony. Crime fiction uh, is, I think, contemplating all of the time the mm. meaning of that harmony and the the and what what it what it means to disrupt it. Have you have you heard of this uh, another book which which I'm yet to read but it's it's on my it's on top of my TBR. It's called We Need to Talk About Kevin. Uh, I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Mm. Um, the, uh, it's, it's also I, it, it, it also deals with uh, school school uh, like classroom shooting a boy who just goes to school and kills seven of his classmates and the teacher and estranged uh, you know family family backdrop and the child's difficult uh, you know difficult um, childhood and his relationship with his parents so so yeah so you know like there um, there's a very interesting line that i found in uh, one of your articles uh, professor which in which you say that crime crime fiction has relied heavily on influence and imitation could you could you just elaborate and you know and explain what you mean by this certainly think about for example uh, any genre of music that has specific mm -hmm. formulas 
uh, such as uh, in America, the blues. That uh, if, uh, somebody who starts listening to blues music for the first time might say, all of this stuff sounds the same. But uh, somebody who is a fan of the blues is going to listen to these and say, of course they don't sound the same. These are all different songs. And, and look how this one's different from that one. But the blues relies on a very clearly defined set of song structures. And rarely do artists stray from those, from those song structures. So um, crime and detective fiction is similar to the blues in the mm -hmm. sense that the, story, that, the, that the story structures are out there and a lot of the creativity takes mm. place within those structures. It's the difference between uh, genre fiction and so-called literary fiction. Now, mm. I think that that, fix, that distinction is artificial. Mm. It's, uh, one might as well say that, that blues, blues music isn't, isn't mm. real art. But, the, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, the idea of creating something within a set of established conventions oh as opposed to making, making up the, the structure out of whole cloth, those are two different kinds of creativity. And uh, crime writers are, most of them, highly conscious of the models mm. who have given, given life to the story structures that they're working within. The simplest idea that uh, a, um, a crime occurs and a detective appears on the scene to solve the crime and point the finger and say, I accuse you, you are, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to close ranks around you, we're going to spirit you away and we're going to purify society by taking the criminal out of its midst. That's a, that's a story structure that goes back at least as far as Oedipus Rex, where, where Oedipus is the detective who is solving a crime. And it turns out, of course, ironically, that he is the murderer that he seeks himself. And um, he punishes himself. He doesn't kill himself, but he, he puts out his own eyes. So uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that Oedipus Rex is a, uh, a genre story. The conventions for detect the detective story genre emerged in the 19th century. And Edgar Allan Poe is generally the one who's given credit for devising those conventions in four short stories that he wrote in the 1840s, starring the detective Auguste Dupin. And if, if you go back and read those stories, the first one is Murders in the Rue Morgue. I, I think that, um, that listeners to this, to, the, to, to this webcast, you'll find an awful lot that is familiar about those stories because the conventions that Poe mm -hmm. established in those 1840 stories are enduring. They were picked up by writers like Arthur Conan Doyle and, uh, and who made them enormously popular in the sh in, with Sherlock Holmes and they endure. And so when we talk about how uh, crime fiction is an art form that is uh, heavily, that, that traffics heavily in influence and imitation, there are people who write Sherlock Holmes stories even today because the character is in the public domain. There is perhaps no more eloquent demonstration of the power of influence and imitation than that the most beloved character in the history of crime fiction is one who continues to inspire storytellers of these times. Stephen King has written a Sherlock Holmes story. And so Stephen King, of course, has, a, has his own uh, is, is influential in his own right. But Stephen King is a lover of crime fiction. And when, he is, when he's written uh, crime stories, and, and he's written quite a number of them, he often drops in characters from other people's crime novels or drops their names. Another example of the, of the way that influence and imitation animate this genre. So uh, here I think I just want, want to you know, come up with a technical <laughs> question. True crime inspires a lot of lot of writers to kind of start penning a book. So, you know, in your opinion, how should an author trying to write a true crime fiction, how should he uh, develop his skills? And if he's basing the uh, the story on true crime, what what are the what are the important steps that the writer should follow? 
Uh, well, in, you're uh, in casting in the this, story, in giving more flesh to the story, and you know. I I, I have a couple of general uh, ge general pieces of advice here. One is do the research. That is, if you want to if you want to use a, uh, a an actual event as the basis for a story, do the research. Learn as much about the event as you can. And second, use your imagination. For, for example, uh, two of the most famous crime novels in, uh, modern, in modern history in Ameri in, in, on the American side are James M. Cain's The Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity, which he wrote in rapid succession in the early 1930s, mm. uh, mid-1930s, I should say. Both of those stories are inspired by the real life story of Ruth Snyder, who um, with, her, with her lover conspired to kill her husband for insurance money. And um, the, uh, uh, the Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity are two different stories, that, and, but each of them imagines the murder of a husband for an insurance payoff. Hmm. Neither of them very closely resembles the Ruth Snyder story because Cain immersed himself in the Ruth Snyder story and then departed from it, used his, own, used his own imagination. Those are great novels. They're a lot of fun to read. So I'd recommend them to the viewers of this webcast. Great. So, uh, so anything else you would like to add for our, for our viewers? Many of them are you know, budding authors, aspiring, uh, uh, budding writers, um, aspiring to get published. Any, uh, you know, any writing tip advice? That you would uh, that you would have for them. Well, uh, the uh, I'll I will I will say that um, I'll I'll end with an observation. I, I I have a PhD student right now who is preparing a dissertation on war literature, and one of the arguments that he's preparing himself to make is that war war literature should not be segregated from the rest of literature. That there's a way that all literature is war literature and war literature is part of all literature, that the boundary between stories of war and um, everything else is a lot more permeable and fuzzy than we're used to thinking of it. And that when, um, when we think about stories that are inflected by war, we shouldn't just be thinking about combat stories. And uh, I think that this is even more true about crime literature, that there's, there's a way that we put crime literature in a box and we say, oh, okay, if you want to walk into a bookstore and you look, to, look for the mystery section or the, um, uh, and, and you'll find a certain, certain, certain kinds of books. And it's true that those stories are uh, driven by the same set of conventions that I was talking about a few minutes ago. But it's also true, and I think that our conversation has touched on this, it's also true that our, uh, that, that literature is not uh, set, it, it, it isn't divided up into little boxes like that. And that if we're going to look at crime literature, really we should also recognize its highly permeable boundary with the rest of literature in the same way that crime in real life is a form of human experience and not separable from those, from other forms of human experience. We need, if we're, going, if we're going to understand crime, whether in truth or in fiction, we need to understand it in relation to the range of human experience. And I think if you, whether you're planning to write crime fiction or read it, it's useful to keep that in mind. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for, for talking to me and for sharing your views. And I'm sure, uh, you know, reading about your work, reading your work and hearing you speak, uh, many uh, budding writers will be inspired to write about true crime. I myself, have, as I said, I've always been very, very fascinated by true crime. In fact, I often uh, do a Google search about unsolved cases and cases from, from, from the past and, you know, and put them up in a, in a, in a file for, for later use, for later research. So thank you so much. It was wonderful talking to you and it was, uh, it was great um, kind of seeing you and listening to you. Um, Please stay safe. And, uh, you know, in these times, I think that's the most important thing that we can wish each other. That please stay safe, stay well. And thank you once again for, for being with us on Tell Me Your Story. Thank you. Thank you. The, the pleasure is entirely mutual.